you've clicked on this video because you are looking to set up your own 12 volt electrical system and you're feeling really overwhelmed and you don't know where to start and it's all a lot of information to take in then you have come to the right place. And even if you're looking for someone else to install your system, it's also a good place to be because we can teach you how to understand your system because understanding your system means when problems arise, then you can diagnose them yourself and know how to get around them. So stick around until the end as well because we'll give you some extra tips on how to optimize your system and maximize the battery storage that you have. So the reason I wanted to make this video is when it came time to plan our build I was just totally overwhelmed. It's such a broad subject and I just didn't know where to start and through actually building two vans I've realised that even with all the research you do there's still some things that change and things that you can't plan for so we're just going to discuss some topics, things that we've found that the way the system behaves and just some things to think about and hopefully it'll help you. So first up is the planning stage. Now this step is absolutely crucial because it's going to set you up for everything later on down the track. What you want to do first is choose your appliances. And when I say choose them, I mean choose the exact appliance that you want to be using in your van. So that includes your fridge, your air fryer if you want one, if you're going to have a microwave. Coffee machine. Everything. Lights, fans. Like choose the exact model because they all have different power requirements and that's going to determine all the rest of the things so first of all choose exactly what you want every phone every charging thing that you're going to be using in the van whether you're living in it or traveling write them all down and that's going to be your starting point so from there what we're going to do is research on every single appliance or device what kind of power usage it will be taking by knowing this it will make it a lot easier for you to add up your total power requirements and go from there in knowing what kind of system you need. Now, with planning also comes your layout section. Now, the layout is really important here as well because it will help you determine what size cables you need, what length of cables you need, and it can be a real money saver down the track. First, very first thing is determine where you want your battery to be located. And keeping in mind that the closer it is to your motor, if you're using a DC to DC charger, then it means less cabling that you're going to have to use or run down the rest of the van. So if you're having your battery and your electrical system at the back, it's going to be more costly and it's going to cause a bit of voltage drop along the way, which is another thing we'll discuss. And in determining where your battery is going to be, you also want to know exactly where your appliances and charging points are going to be in the van as well. So that will mean whether you're running cables on both sides of the van, whether you're running them above or below, you'll need to know exactly where it needs to be before you start insulating and before you start building cabinets. Yeah, so you'll think to yourself, okay, the power system, like that, that's way down the line. That doesn't need done until I'm nearly finished, but you have to plan it all now. It's a lot easier to plan it all out and know what you're going to need before you start all that. So this video is covering the 12 volt side of things. You are able to do the 12 volt side with no certification. Any 240 volt electrics, so that's anything that uses like house um, sockets and stuff, it has to be done by a qualified electrician and it needs a certification to go with it. But that's not to say that the 12 volt side isn't dangerous. So you can still set a car on fire with 12 volt stuff. Um, the voltage is a lot safer, but you can still do a lot of damage. So if you're going to tackle this, do as much research as you can and figure out what things cause problems and how to check for it and just be up to speed on on what can go wrong. So again, this doesn't cover any of the 240 volt stuff. It's just 12 volt only. So when it comes to the power requirements for each device, you want to write out a list of all your stuff. So for example, we have eight lights. So you go onto the manufacturer's website, you find out the exact power draw of one light. So for example, one light would use say half an amp. It probably uses less, but we'll just use this as an example. So we have eight lights and we estimate we'll want to use them for maybe three hours a night. So you would go and you would write half an amp times eight times three hours and you work out exactly how many amp hours that that would use. In a day. Yeah, so that's your average usage for one day for just your lights. Then what you do is you go and you have your fans. 
and you say that you want to use your fans for example overnight so you're going to want to use them for say 12 hours go on find out the power draw for the fans so that's going to be variable because the fan speed can go up and down so you can take an average of it or you can just assume that you're going to be using the max at all times which you're not but it's going to give you more headroom down the line so take the max draw of the fan we've got two of them you're going to use them for 12 hours per night and then you add that on and you go through each and every individual device so you go through your phones your laptop if you use a blender if you use a coffee machine and you got to work out the coffee machine is going to be running for maybe five minutes to heat up the water you know you got to like time how long it takes and how many coffees you're going to have per day and stuff like that so it's it's a lot of planning to do beforehand but when you do it that's going to give you a total amount of amp hours that you'll use in an average day or the max amount of amp hours you're going to use in a day once you have that number you have to think about the way that you want to travel is this something that you're just going to be using for two three days at a time or is it something you're going to be living in full time are you going to be parked up for a week without moving are you going to have access to power all the time that you can top up your batteries once you figure out the the type of living you're going to be doing and your power requirements you can start to size up the battery so for example if you found out that you needed 100 amp hours per day having a 200 amp hour battery would let you fully use all your stuff with no charge coming in for two days if you put a 300 amp hour battery in then you could use all your things full usage for three days the worst case scenario is you're not going to have any charge coming in at all so that would be in a situation where it's totally cloudy for a few days you're off grid you're not driving so like that's going to be the the final limit on what your system can do you know it's it's hard to plan for this because you don't know what way you're going to be using it and you just you just gotta things change all the time yeah so obviously a bigger battery means you can stay off grid for longer you can power more devices and you've less to worry about but with that comes a lot more cost and a lot more space in your van or your caravan or whatever you're setting up so it is better to have a bigger battery but it's not always feasible it's not always economical so you really got to be realistic with how how long you want to stay off grid and how long you're going to be without having a charging option the best way to charge your batteries especially in australia is to use solar it's there all the time it's not efficient all the time but it's there it's it's just a constant passive top up of your batteries so the general rule to go for is whatever amp hours of battery bank you have if you double that in watts of solar so if you have a 200 amp hour battery the ideal amount is to have 400 watts of solar if you've got 300 the ideal amount is 600 watts of solar and the reason for that is say you had a huge 900 amp hour battery but you only have 200 watts of solar you're not going to be able to fill that up again you know having such a big battery bank and not being able to top it up you're just constantly losing charge at all times so you really need to be able to top that back up again and solar is pretty cheap it's a good way to ensure that your batteries are going to be constantly topped up another device that you might have in your setup is a 240 volt inverter so what that does is convert your 12 volt dc connections or power source to 240 volt so you can plug house electrics into it and stuff so that's for running chargers and blenders, blenders and stuff like that now a lot of people just buy the biggest inverter because they're pretty cheap so you can get a 3000 watt inverter but if the maximum device that you're running is say only 500 watts or whatever like if you're just charging the vacuum cleaner or running a blender or something that's total overkill for your system so only get a big inverter if you're running high power devices and the reason for that is whenever the inverter's inverter is running it constantly uses a, a certain percentage of that 3000 watts so you're you're just hurting yourself if you've got a big inverter and you don't actually need it and there's also thicker cables and stuff that are required so it's it's just more money so when it comes to fitting solar to your system if you've just got one panel it doesn't need a fuse depending on the panel if it if you've got two you do need a fuse usually if you've got more than two you definitely do so i find this amazing 
um, website that goes through all the scenarios, whether you're running your, your panels in series or parallel. It tells you how to work out what fuses it needs, if it needs fuses, what size they're going to be, where to locate them, and everything. It's a fantastic link. So if you just go through and read through that and compare it with the type of system that you want, but you'll find all the information you need there to fuse your solar system. Once you figure out what size of battery you need, how much solar you're going to need, you want to work out the other ways to charge it. And another really common way is to use a DC-DC charger, which converts the alternator power from your car and puts it into your house battery. It's just an efficient way, like if you don't have sun one day and you know you're driving. So the DC-DC charger is going to put a lot of power into your battery whenever you're moving and you're, you're going to be moving around a lot, so it's a good thing to have. With that, there's a bit of efficiency loss too, and that comes down to your wire sizes. So with all your devices, you want to maintain the power output that they have, and the way to do that is by correctly sizing all your cables. And there's a few things that affect power output, and one of those is voltage drop. So voltage drop means if your battery's putting out 14 volts, for example, by the time it travels to the device, it will have lost some of that. So there's some devices that rely on uh, exact voltage to operate. And if the voltage drops below that, they'll just stop working. That's called critical voltage drop. And that's what you need to avoid on something like a fridge. So once a fridge hits a certain cutoff voltage, it'll just stop working. Whereas you have other things that aren't critical like lights. So if lights aren't getting the correct voltage, they'll just be dim. Your DC-DC charger, I would say it's a critical thing, but obviously if it's not getting the correct voltage, it'll just put less into your battery. But you wanna maximize how much is going into your battery. For things like inverter, your fridge, any other high draw devices like a hot water system, for those you wanna make sure that the voltage drop is minimal. There's a great chart that you can look at and it'll tell you the thickness of the cable you need and Depending on how long the run of the cable is, you'll have to size it differently. So if you have a short run between the two sources, the battery and the device, then there's going to be less voltage drop. If you have a thick cable between the two devices, there's going to be less voltage drop. So this chart that we'll link here is really good for just sizing up how thick the cable needs to be, depending on what the device is and how far away it is from your battery. So this chart has American wire sizes and metric, and it also tells you the lengths for voltage drop and critical voltage drop, and it gives you the current flow. So if you know that your device is going to be pulling 10 amps and it's five meters away, you can follow this chart along and see how thick the cable needs to be so there's no voltage drop over that distance. Um, there's also a little conversion on it to convert the two wire sizes. You need to consult this chart with basically every single device and make sure it's all sized properly because it'll save you headaches down the line whenever you're wondering why a device isn't running properly or doesn't get enough power. So another thing that'll cause problems with devices not running properly, not getting the correct voltage is poor connectors. A lot of fridges will come with a cigarette plug connector and it just pushes into a socket. It's okay for use now and again, but for long-term use and for heavy duty use, if you're going off-road or anything, they're a really poor choice because the wiggle and they come loose. And whenever they come loose and have a poor connection, that creates resistance and resistance adds in heat, puts more stress on your wires, your fuses, and the fridge won't run as well. So it's worth doing a bit of research and find out what the best connector is for different devices. For solar panels, you can get a waterproof connector that's called an MC4 connector, and it clips together so it won't rattle loose and no water can get into it. You can also use Anderson connectors, which aren't waterproof, but they have a really good solid connection. And for stuff that bolts onto like terminals, uh, eyelets and stuff, you need really crimp your terminals on and make sure that you've got the proper tool to crimp them. You're using the right size terminals for the right size of cable 
and they're also the right crimps. So there's different types of crimps. There's ones that squash the cable. There's ones that are like hexagon ones that crimp it from all sides. But using the, the proper tool and the proper connector will save you so much hassle down the line. So another thing you need to worry about is your fuses. There's another chart you can use on how to correctly fuse your cables. Uh, I'll link that below. So again, after you've figured out how thick a cable you're using, then you need to fuse that cable correctly because the fuse is to protect the wiring. It's not to protect the device. Once you've figured out that, you can go onto the fuse chart. And there's a lot of different types of fuses. So there's blade fuses, there's MIDI fuses, there's auto circuit breakers. This chart has all the different versions, but I would recommend using proper heavy duty bolt-in fuses where you can. They're just more reliable. And I've used auto circuit breakers in the past because I thought, you know, if something does trip, I don't want to have to replace a fuse or bolt one, or maybe I don't have one on hand. So I just use those, but I find that they're an absolute nightmare. They trip at way lower rating than they're supposed to, and I've ended up swapping them all out anyway. And now I just keep some spur fuses on hand, but I haven't even needed those spur fuses because all the wires are correctly sized and the fuses are correctly sized. Using those bolt-in types is just so much more reliable. So with all that, you've got a huge list of things that you need to buy. And I find just Going to the shop and buying what you need isn't enough. You always got to add a bit more on. There's a few times that I bought, measured out the cable size that I need. And the difference between, say, the house battery and the starter battery might be two meters in distance. But by the time you run the cable down and across and through a certain hole and then across the other side, it ends up adding extra onto the cable. So you really got to buy a bit extra. Another thing I found was sometimes you'll crimp a terminal on, you know, you maybe cut a wire size, crimp a terminal on, then crimp the other side on and it won't bite properly or you know, give it a tug to make sure it's tight and it pulls off. That terminal is now scrap, you can't use it. You've also got a bit of wire this size that has a good terminal on it. That's now scrap, you can't really use it. Well, not for what you were going to anyway, you know, it, you got to run back to the shop and get another one. So I find buying the exact amount is just a recipe for disaster. You always get caught out. So if you can, buy bulk packs, buy more than you need, and buy more cable than you need. Once you go through your wire size chart, you might find that, that you need a 15 amp cable for this, a 5 amp cable for this, a 50 amp cable for this, and a 100 amp cable for this. And sometimes it can be cheaper to just use you can't use the one type of cable for everything but for example if you can buy a 100 meter roll of 15 amp cable you can use that on all your lower ones rather than spending extra money buying 10 meters of this 10 meters of that 10 meters of the other you can just use you can over engineer it so you're running better cables through the whole van or the whole system and what that means is down the line, if you ever need to add another device on, so we find that maybe put an extra charger in somewhere, you've got the overhead there that you can add something else on. Whereas if you just run the bare minimum of cable, that's it. It's, you know, you have to run another cable if you want to add another charging port or something like that. In. Another good thing to have is a voltmeter. So as you're building it, you can test the connections, make sure that you're not getting any voltage drop and it's something that you're going to need down the line anyway to just diagnose your system and test things and just see how everything's running even before you connect things up so it's really good to have a voltmeter on hand you're going to need a lot of heat shrink and the reason for that is to stop moisture getting into your connections and just to make sure your cables don't have any exposed metal on them that can create a short or anything like that so you want to get a big bulk pack of all different sizes of heat shrink you want conduit so you can run cables through metal parts of the system without rubbing because over time if you've got a cable that's rubbing it'll and it will because the van is moving it's just constantly vibrating so that creates a nice hard plastic shell that you can run your cable up through and again it also means if you ever need to run another cable you can just find that hole and push the cable up through yeah so expect to buy 
a lot more than you need. When it comes to our system, we done all this research at the start and figured out that we would need a 300 amp hour battery to live comfortably. Since then, we've actually added a lot more devices that are pushing the limits of our system. So we've added a electric hot water system and induction cooking. We always had, we planned to use the air fryer at the start, but now we use the air fryer, the induction and the hot water system on top of all the other things that we plan for. So we've got a 300 amp hour full tax battery. We've got 480 watts of solar on the roof. So that's 360 watt panels. We've got a 50 amp Renogy DC DC charger. That charger is, has a built in solar controller. So all our panels are running through the DC DC charger. To be honest, I would recommend you get a separate solar controller. Now, I don't know about all DC DC chargers, but I know with the Renogy one, if it's getting any input from solar, it'll cut the alternator's input to 25 amps. So the max you'll get is 25 amps from solar and 25 amps from the alternator. But we found a lot driving on a cloudy day, you might only be pulling one or two amps. And then if you're doing a two hour drive, you'll only be getting 25 amps from your alternator and two or three amps from the solar. So it's actually better to switch off the solar and get the full 50 amps Maximize. and just ignore what the solar is producing. However, if we had a separate solar controller, you would add those two or three amps onto 50 and then you would be getting 53 the whole time. So that's one thing that we'll wanna change. But you just gotta check the specs on your DC DC charger and just see what, what it can handle. Some of them are only rated to maybe 10 amps of solar or 20 amps of solar. So if you've got more than that, then you're gonna to wanna to size the DC DC charger correctly or size your solar controller correctly. So if you look at a solar controller, it'll tell you what the maximum input is in watts. So if you've say 400 watts of panels and you're allowed to have 660 or whatever. So you gotta go onto the manufacturer's website, look at the specifications and just see what, what the actual rating is and size it appropriately. Uh, we also have a 3000 watt inverter and that's because our air fryer pulls around 2,400. So we needed a big beefy inverter, but that's pretty much all that uses a lot of power for the inverter. The hot water system is 12 volt and 240 volt. So you can choose, if you're using it on 12 volt, it takes about an hour to heat the water up, but it uses less power. Whereas if you want to heat the water up fast, you can plug it into the inverter and use 240 volt and that'll heat the water up really quickly, but it'll use less power. It's only like 15 minutes or something, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's less, it uses more power, but it uses it for less time, but it still works out just with the inefficiencies in the inverter, it still works out slightly less efficient, but if you pull up somewhere and you want hot water fast, it's, it's perfect. The heavy draw items that we have are basically our cooking devices. So we also have a rice cooker, which we use to cook rice pasta, potatoes. Generally that's just running in the, on the side. And then we use one induction hot plate to cook whatever, a stir fry or pasta sauce, whatever we're, we're making. We found that the rice cooker uses around 70 amps on full power. If we're using the induction beside that, it's pulling about 100 amps. Generally, if we're making something in the air fryer, we won't be using those other two devices. The air fryer can pull 200 amps whenever it's on. The hot water pulls about 25 amps. The fridge is a constant draw. And although it only uses a little bit, which we've worked out to be average around four amps, it uses it constantly. It's, so. it's a 24 seven device. So you've got to keep that in consideration as well. So whenever you're checking the, the specifications, on the fridge it'll tell you how many amps it uses in ideal situations so on the, the specs on ours is between 1.5 and 2 amps or it in the manual it'll tell you that it uses 60 watts so it uses 60 watts when it's on and cycling but they have worked out that it only cycles maybe half the time so 60 watts when you convert it into amps is around 5 amps you'll divide it by 12 so if that's the only information you're getting from your 
specs, then that's how you convert that. So we found out that the fridge actually uses four amps all the time. And the reason for that is we spend a lot of time in hot climates, so north of 35 degrees. The fridge, we have given it a decent amount of circulation, but sometimes you put your hand down the side and you can feel that it's, it's really hot. But like any fridge, trying to get down to 30 degrees below ambient temperature is going to struggle. That's something where you check the usage on the, from the manufacturer, but real world usage is actually a lot higher. With using all those devices, hot water, cooking, and the fridge running all day, when you add that up, it can take 100 amps out of our battery in one hit. So that's in one evening of cooking, and by the time we wake up the next morning, it's whacked 33% off the battery. So if you're not in ideal conditions or if you're not driving somewhere, that really starts to, you know, you can really notice the discharge in the battery. So small draws like lights and fans are really, they're next to nothing compared to those big heavy draw items like that. Like talking realistically too, we don't actually use the hot water every day. No, especially if we're in a hot climate. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is inefficiencies in the system and Basically, heat is your biggest killer of efficiency. So the solar panels, their peak efficiency is operating around 25 degrees, which I've noticed a big difference. If we're somewhere cooler, but it's nice and sunny, the system can keep up, no problem. And another reason why that is, is because the fridge isn't working as hard either. So it's not sapping all the power, plus you're getting more input and less output. So if we're somewhere that's really hot and humid and cloudy, it's 35 degrees, you're not getting any solar, you know, you're not getting any direct sunlight, but the, the odd time the sun does come out, the panels are so hot anyway that it's even less efficient. So you're just constantly battling, you know, trying to keep the van cool, but also top up your power. High use, traveling a lot, Good sun and cool temperatures means we have no issues at all. But if we're high use and it's cloudy and we're parked up for a while, like we really got to watch the battery system and make sure that we're optimizing it. So some of the ways we optimize it is switch off the solar anytime we're driving, get that full 50 amps. Again, like I say, I want to upgrade that so I don't need to worry about it and we're getting constant solar input and full amps from the battery every time. Another thing we'll do is while we're driving, if I notice the battery's full, I'll just flick the hot water system on. So our hot water system holds 10 liters of water, hot for hours. So if I stick it on, rather than waiting until the sun goes down and we actually need the hot water, that's already done, you know, and the battery will be at 100% and we'll have hot water. We'll charge the laptop while driving, charge the drone cameras just check you know stuff like that charge it while driving rather than whenever we're stopped and it's night time and we're not getting any input uh, another thing is don't use the inverter for things that you don't need so the laptop comes with a house plug but we find because we put the correct size cables in and because we put a decent usb charger so we went for the highest wattage usb charger that was available we can just charge the laptop straight off the USB. USB-C. USB-C. And if you buy a cheaper USB-C or if you only have, say, a five amp cable or like a smaller cable running to it, it won't actually produce enough power to charge the laptop. And then you have to switch the inverter on, plug it in, and then you're losing more efficiency just because that, that's running. And that's a 3000 watt inverter and I don't know what wattage the laptop is, but it's very little. So you're really wasting a, a lot of power there. You can't plan for absolutely everything and the conditions do vary a lot. So hopefully this just gives you an idea of things you can expect and how to plan. It's good to understand your system and, and diagnose And know how you it. travel. Yeah. So if you understand your system, you'll understand whenever something isn't working as good as it should. So at the minute, I've realized that our solar panels really, like, really aren't keeping up. Like we're parked up at the minute and we're not using, we're cooking using outside facilities and we're not using hot water or anything. And even still, the solar panels 
how the battery is going down every Full day. Full sun. Full sun. Basically, I noticed that the system wasn't performing as it should. And that's just from knowing what the numbers usually are and what they're doing at the minute. So I got up and had a look on one of the connectors. It's a three to one connector for the solar panels. Um, one of them has a crack in it. And when I looked at it, it is corroded on the inside. So I tested the panels individually and I added up what the amps they should be putting out. And when I look at what's coming into our charger, they don't match up. So I've ordered a new connector. Just knowing things about your system, it helps you keep on top of things and knowing when something's wrong. And then like I knew there was an issue with the solar system. So we'll go up and check there. If you notice there's a problem with your fridge drawing more power than usual, you trace the fridge power line and see, is it a problem with the connector? Is it a problem with the wiring? Is it a, like a manufacturing problem with the actual fridge or whatever? But understanding your system helps you diagnose these problems especially if you're in the middle of nowhere and you run into that kind of a problem you can kind of work around it and if you do know your system work around it and if you know where you're going to next you have the opportunity to if you need new parts or if you know when you're going to be getting to the next town you can order the parts and have them there for when you get to the next town or know exactly what you need when you get to the town so you can fix it immediately rather than being clueless and then maybe not having power for a few days until you get to where um until you get to civilization another thing do more research you, you really can't do enough research on this hopefully this gives you a few topics where if you don't understand voltage drop or if you don't understand fuses or something you can go and do more research into those areas but this is just things that i've come across while building the 12 volt system that i've had to work out and experiences that we've had in hot areas you know you're producing less you're using more things that we just didn't think about it's just a starting point and check regularly for faults because they pop up and you can't avoid them another thing i want to add is we only have a dc dc charger and solar um, a lot of people have other charging options such as an ac charger which will just plug into 240 volt so if you're parked at a caravan park or whatever, you can top up your batteries. Or some people use generators. Those are like field safes. And if we had one at the minute, it would be sweet because we could just top up the battery, but we don't. So it's another thing to think about if you're going to be off grid for a long time, if you, ha if you have the space to carry those, or if you have, you know, some people already have the battery charger or whatever, bring it along with you. It's just an extra way, the more, different ways you have of charging up the less problems you're going to have if one fails then you're not stuck hopefully this has been helpful for you and don't forget to check those links below we'll put them all there for you and they are a huge help in helping you to understand more about planning your system but thank you for watching to the end we hope these tips have been really helpful and if you do have any more specific questions make sure to write them down in the comments below and we'll get back to you and if you like this video give us a thumbs up subscribe do all the things to see more and if you have any video requests let us know see you next time bye